Hi, good evening, welcome. Come in. Uh, I'm Jennifer Lee, Director of Events at the Washington Post Live. Thank you for joining us for today's program, The Power of Play. Last October, the Washington Post introduced Launcher, a section dedicated to video games and the rapidly evolving esports industry. Today, we aim to bring Launcher to life with conversations about how video games have become platforms for conflict resolution, refuge for the disabled, forms for interactive storytelling, and so much more. We will also look at the exponential growth in esports and the potential challenges faced by the industry as professional leagues and teams are established across the country and around the world. Before we get started, I want to thank our presenting sponsor, the Entertainment Software Association, who recently launched their new game generation campaign, as well as our supporting sponsor, the International Game Developers Association, for today's event. And now let's get started with this short video to introduce our first segment. When we are all willing to see each other, not for just who we want to be, but who we are and who we're meant to be, this act of love and this act of grace can change the world. All right, hello everyone. Good evening. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm Gene Park, uh, and I cover video games and gaming culture for the Washington Post, part of the whole launcher program that you just heard about uh, uh, that just uh, came out in October. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. We have an amazing group of folks from like different corners of, of the gaming sphere, the gaming universe, to talk about how the industry is influencing uh, culture at large. I personally like to call it the rock and roll of the new millennium. Um, so in introducing <laughs> Uh, introducing the, the, the panel here, we have Congresswoman uh, Susan Del Betty from the great state of Washington, um, representing um, the first congressional district. Uh, we have Lua Mayen, who is a video game developer, CEO, and founder of Juno Games. Uh, we have Anita Sarkeesian, who is the founder of Feminist Frequency and a media critic. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Ryan Green, also a game, game developer and the founder and creator of uh, the game that you just saw up there, That Dragon Cancer. Um, one, one, and that was a clip from the Game Awards. So before we begin, uh, thank, you, thank you so much for, all, for you all coming here, coming from different parts of the country. I want to let our audience here and people tuning in online, hey chat, uh, that you can tweet questions using hashtag post live, and I'll pose them to our panel later in the segment. I'll be getting them right here in this little iPad. So let's get started. Um, well, I want to start with you first. Um, you were featured at the Game Awards uh, last December, um, and, and you, where you announced your new game, Salam, which means peace. Uh, your journey to video games is particularly unique. Um, you know, your, your status as a refugee and everything. Can you tell us about how you came about to found Genome Games? We have yeah, time. Uh, for sure. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, you know, video games are a very amazing medium that we can use to bring people together around the world. and. Uh, the first time I got into video game, I, I never knew anything about video game. And one of the lines I always say is that I never thought that video game are created by people. I thought they fall from heaven. Because like, like where I grew up, I, I spent 22 years in a refugee camp. And where, because my family left South Sudan because of the war. So when I was growing up in a refugee camp, and with the journey that my family has taken for years, and I was born on the way as my family was going to the refugee camp, and all they wanted was to find a place of peace where they can be able to have like, you know, peace of mind and, you know, and have their children and everything. And it wasn't an easy journey. So growing up in a refugee camp, I remember one day I, I told my mother and said, like, I want to buy a computer. And she was like, what are you going to do with a computer? Because like, there's no power, there's, there's nothing, there's no school, there's nothing that you can do to be able to learn how to actually program and so on. And being in a refugee camp wasn't like, a place where someone deserved to be there. But for me, I had a passion to be a programmer. 
and she spent three years looking for $300 to, to buy for me a computer. So when she bought for me a computer, I went to an internet cafe where I walked three hours per day to go and charge my computer. And then somebody installed for me a video game called Grand Theft Auto. Oh. Um, so, Which one? Three, uh, four, five? No. So I think that's like uh, three. And then, uh, so when I came back home in a refugee camp, I started playing the game, and I realized the power of game, that people can be able to like make decisions whenever they are playing. You know, I'm from South Sudan. It's, it's a country that is ripped by civil war. And I realized, what can I be able to do to be able to make game for peace and conflict resolution? I never knew anything, so I had to train myself how to make my game. So I made my first video game in a refugee camp so that I can have children in a refugee camp have something to play. And then from there, I started like making Salam, which is coming in, uh, in, in the summer, actually. So it's a game that actually put a play in the shoes of a refugee, because what we are looking at is that people have to understand the journey of the refugee. And when you're playing game, as you're making decision, you're taking a refugee from a war-torn country to a peaceful environment. And all the experiences in the game, it's about my life, it's about my mother, how she struggled. And in the game, as you're going to your final destination, as you're going to win the game, you have to like feed your character so that they have the energy, give them food, and give them medicine so that they can go to the final destination. And what happened is that the, the more impactful way in the game that when actually someone buy food in the game, you are buying someone in a refugee camp food using in-app purchases. If you buy water in the game, you're actually buying someone in a refugee camp water. So it's a game that actually connect the virtual world and the reality on the ground. So like we are using the medium and the game industry to be able to give back and make people understand what is the journey, what does it take for someone to become a refugee. And, and, and that's amazing. And one of the things I always tell people is that when people play the game today and in the next 10 years, they're going to be in a position where they can make decisions and then they actually understand what the journey is. And, and, and that's why I love video games. They are amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you just want people to empathize with the plight of a uh, Yeah, the, the empathy is the most important thing because it engages people. One thing, I was playing a game with my friend and my friend killed my character. You know how I told him? I was like, why did you kill me? I didn't tell him, why did you kill my character? It was part of my life. It was part of something that I make the decision and, and work for it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what has the response been to your game so far? Like when people see what it, they're doing, that they're directly helping refugees? It's, it's, it's been amazing. It's, it's been really great because um, it's something new, which is a challenge, and for us to like execute that. Uh, so what we're doing is partnering with organization and, and uh, partnering with people in the game industry that has been in the journey. And that has been really amazing to see our game studios and helping us and supporting us through the journey, and it's, it's been amazing. Someone uh, one day called me and I, he said that when I see my, my son playing your game uh, and having in-app purchases, helping someone in a refugee camp, it's not like playing a Fortnite and you know, all this mm -hmm. stuff, right? But like, people really understand what games are and how we can be able to help, and we can impact the world and make a world a better place, yeah. It's amazing to recontextualize in-app purchases in that way. It's, it's I, I, pretty incredible. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Luol. <laughs> yeah. Congresswoman, let's, start, let's go, go with you now. Before serving in Congress, you worked in business, software development, and at Microsoft for over a decade. <clears throat> You've also talked about playing video games with your son. I know that you play Golf Story because uh, the Congresswoman was here for a Twitch program last year and she destroyed political reporter Dave Weigel <laughs> golf story. Like it was like, like not even like a, like a competition. Um, but as a tech industry veteran, a parent, a woman, and a lawmaker, how have you seen video games involve? Well, I think um, it's a medium. Mm -hmm. And just as you talked about how you were able to take this and use it to convey a message and to engage people, I think that's also how we should think about the opportunities when we look at games. It's a chance for folks to learn and be engaged, sometimes learn when they don't know they're learning, because we sometimes learn the best when we're having fun and not, don't realize um, that we're being educated as part of it. It's a way to bring people together. And um, so the creativity that's been unlocked as more people get engaged has been really interesting, and I think the work that um, you're doing has really shown that. Um, and it is, uh, it's, there's an approachability to technology that I think is important. You have uh, somebody who can maybe engage in a game that doesn't use technology as much and gets engaged and involved, and we find that um, when it comes to helping 
like people learn to code, for example, making a game. Things like Hour of Code were a way of kind of making it a game, and people all of a sudden realized they were programming and they didn't know that. Um, the ability to kind of engage both um, technology and creativity is so important when you have the artists who are working on games and the creativity that's involved. Because we know great innovation happens when people think out of the box, and creativity is a big part of that. We talk about STEM education, but we talk about STEAM. And I think when we talk about the types of products that come um, here, that interface, that interaction um, is so important. Mm -hmm. And those are helpful in a lot of other ways going forward. So, um, But I do think the ability to tell a story, to engage communities in that story, to help people um, um, get to know each other in a different ways, I think is an incredible opportunity that is we're seeing more and more of now. I'm glad you brought up STEM, STEM education because a few years ago you hosted an event uh, for Teach a Girl to Tech Day and you played Mario Kart with elementary and middle Not school. Not as good in Mario girls. Kart as I was at Golf Story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so how can prom gaming promote uh, uh, the women in, in STEM related fields? Um, well, because of that, engaging folks in ways that they may not expect. I think sometimes you go in a room and you sit down, and um, it has been technology traditionally has been sometimes intimidating. And when you allow someone individually to get engaged and involved, to um, maybe get a pro to find it to be approachable because it's something you're interested in. As I said, you learn without um, realizing it, and then you start to have ideas and maybe talk to other people about it and have the opportunity then to maybe get more involved and realize there are opportunities there. Young women in particular, I think, have always kind of felt that there weren't as many opportunities in technology, and we find when you let them have that opportunity to engage and find ways that are interesting for them, um, you break down those barriers. Mm -hmm. And I think we have the opportunity for people to engage with technology in ways that are comfortable with them. It might be the different type of game they choose, yeah. et cetera, mm -hmm. that helps get them engaged and involved. And, um, and then their great ideas are things that we can see in the future. And the diversity of folks who are involved in building different technology and building games, that diversity gives us the diversity of opportunities and, and um, experiences that we're starting to see unlocked because more, lots of people are coming together, not just a smaller group, but from um, across the country, but also around the world. Mm -hmm. Engagement is important. You yes. want to be able to learn. Um, I definitely didn't want to learn math, but had to. So. But sometimes you learn and you don't know you're learning. And yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's the best, best part, part, right? Yes. Um, Anita, I think this is a good opportunity to bring you in and talk about culture. Uh, even backstage, we were talking about how your work has been about the broader culture, not even just about video games. But how has your work as a media critic through Feminist Frequency uh, helped open up dialogue in terms of uh, female perspectives uh, in the video game industry in particular? <laughs> I know there's a long history there, so. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, which side of that would you like to hear? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I think that, um, uh, what was it, eight years ago now, I launched a series that looked at the way women were represented in video games, particularly the bad ways women are represented in gaming. Um, there's a very long history of misogyny and racism and transphobia and homophobia in gaming, and the work that I do as a feminist media critic is to try to find those patterns and show people that they exist and give them tools for how to move forward and how to make games better. Mm -hmm. um, it was received... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there was a, a lot of people very angry at me, if uh, we want to be kind about it. Um, asterisk, asterisk. Thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but the, the part that I'm more interested in than all of the hate was that um, the industry itself, many people in the industry itself, um, were really engaged with the work. Um, they were very hungry to learn more, to, you know, it, one of the, the best things that I heard was developers would come up to me at events and say, hey, you critiqued my game and I'm so glad you did and I'm not going to do that again, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to have a damsel in my game. I'm not going to use a woman's body as a reward for players. Um, and, and that, all of that allowed us to start moving forward as an industry in some ways to talk about, like, what do we want out of our games? What do those look like? Um, what, what? whose stories are worth telling and how do we tell them? And the other side of that is who gets to tell those stories? Who gets hired? Who gets the opportunity to make games? And what does that look like? And so um, in addition to my work, I think that there has been a huge opening in the last decade of feminist, intersectional feminist media critics talking about this across 
industry mm -hmm. um, and, and really being able to have that perspective amplified in a way that previously was kind of stuck in academia or in smaller communities. Yeah, always with these like little narrative type like discussions or whatever, and mm -hmm. kind of broke out into the mainstream. Um, given of what you've seen since then and these conversations that you've been having, that you've been having how hopeful are you? Like, where do you think we are today? Um, oh. I, it sounds like there's been <laughs> like the needle has moved a little bit, but yeah, of you know. course. I mean, I think it depends on what day you ask me that question. You know, yeah. it is it's <clears throat> it's one of those. You know, everyone wants to hear that things are getting better, and they don't want to hear that it's not. The reality is, a lot of things are getting worse globally, politically, um, and that video games are a part of that space where we're having these massive cultural wars about like retaining and holding on to the status quo or really working towards a progressive future that is liberatory for everybody. Mm -hmm. And video games were one of the, the first mainstream arenas in which that war kind of erupted out of. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in some ways it's worse. I think that the communities, the, the hateful, aggressive, vitriolic communities are more emboldened and empowered to spread hate. Um, and in other ways, I think that there is such a conversation blooming that developers are really trying to do better. And, and I have seen some of that progress over the years mm -hmm. um, where, you know, bringing in consultants or, or, or being mindful of hiring practices or, you know, taking, like, if, if a particular aspect of a game is critiqued, correcting it without defensiveness, without, you know, all of it. Um, and so in that way, I think we are seeing some progress, but it does feel a little bit like one step forward, two steps back. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with the, the onus is on the developers, but is there an onus on the audience too as well? You know, like, the, the, as consumers, right? Sure. I mean, uh, the audience cannot be terrible yeah. <laughs> to to other to, to developers and other folks. I think um, I think that for me, it's important that the the public and and game players and and media consumer or media people who engage with media in general um, have the tools to be able to interpret what they are engaging with. And I think, like you're saying earlier, that we learn the most when we don't think we're learning. Mm -hmm. And media is one of those air arenas where we don't think we're learning. So what are the messages and values embedded in our media that we are passively taking in on a, you know, day to day, decade after decade, for example. And that's what I like to do. I like to give people the language to just identify it. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily don't play that game. You know, I kind of scoffed when you talked about Grand Theft Auto, but it's not necessarily like don't play that game. It's play it, but be aware of what's in it. Be, you know, have your brain kind of turned on and engage with it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's, you know, we have a motto at Feminist Frequency, be critical of the media you love, really trying to give permission to folks to have that kind of complicated relationship with media. And I think mm -hmm. that's how we move forward. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And I think that's a great uh, uh, way to kind of pivot to Ryan and the, the kind of messages that you put out there, um, specifically Dad Dragon Cancer. For anyone who might not know, can you just talk about the game in general? Yeah, sure. Um, Dad Dragon Cancer was um, a poetic retelling of uh, the life of our family. And uh, our third son, my wife and I, Amy's third son, Joel, who was diagnosed with cancer, uh, uh, a very aggressive brain cancer when he was one year old. Um, and despite um, uh, the terminal diagnosis that he received when he was two years old, he lived for um, uh, four more years. Uh, and so in that span of time, we endeavored to create this video game that reflected the, um, his life and, and reflected our personal and spiritual journey. Um, and so, you know, I grew up in a, in a, in a culture that told me that the culture, uh, a subculture that told me the broader culture would hate me for my, my faith. Um, and as Christians, you know, we wanted to share with people the, 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 the love and the power of God. And, and in the midst of this struggle, we thought, wow, what if we could tell this video game story about being helpless, being, um, having things out of our control and the miracle that was happening in Joel's life. Mm -hmm. What if Joel lived? And um, you know, you think often of video games are, are spoken of as power fantasies, you know, and mm -hmm. and um, and so in that sense, we almost went into it with a power fantasy of our own. You know, what would it look like if God showed up in the way that we dictated, and the world could see that? Um, unfortunately, Joel passed away in 2014, and. Um, 
And what started out as this story that we were hoping to tell of a miracle became Joel's memorial. Um, and, but what was amazing is that that culture that we told, that was, you know, that I grew up believing was going to reject us, embraced us. Uh, they made room for us. At every level of the games industry and the broader culture in general, they, they made space for us to tell our story. Um, it, it wasn't a, a story of power, it was a story of, of helplessness, and it was, but it was still a story of hope. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that the common thing that, that I see in this culture is that we all feel a little hopeless and helpless and that things are swirling that are out of our control, that violently want to destroy us, you know? Um, and so what we experienced in, in, in releasing this game was um, a moment where uh, the people chose to love us in the midst of our weakness. And so, you know, it's, um, it, was a, it was a privilege <laughs> to be able to have that experience, and I know that uh, many people don't, especially people on this stage, um, but um, it, it was a glimmer to me of, of something that we could endeavor to when we uh, consume and create our media because we love video games and, and, and believe that it is a medium in which we can um, introduce ourselves and that I can learn more about you and we can have a conversation about who we are. I just want to mention also that Dead Dragon Cancer is available for playing outside an arcade. So if you guys want to check out this beautiful game, you should definitely check it out. Um, just You saw the art. It looks amazing. Mm -hmm. I also want to ask you one more thing before we get to some audience questions, too. Um, what kind of stories have you told, like, like what have been told to you in terms of like how it's helped, it might have helped people process their grief and their, their own sorrow? Oh. Um. Or how has that made you feel? How well, I, I think one of the things that, that struck me the most in going into the industry is how many people would just, um, I believe it was uh, Jerry Holkins, one of the founders of, of, of PAX, he, he told me at the first PAX event, he's like, you traded in a currency of intimacy and people wanted to pay you back. And so what ended up happening is that we would be in these conventions with, if you've ever been to a consumer convention, it's 100,000 people mm -hmm. all in costume, right, um, <laughs> of their favorite characters and, and just, cons um, just hungry for their favorite games. And we were there in the midst, hugging each other. They were telling us stories of their lives. They were telling stories of the children that they had lost, um, the family members that had gone before them. And, and we shared an intimacy that was rather peculiar in that context. And so I think that this game has given us permission to talk about hard things long after people stop asking about them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, we have a question from Katie on Facebook. Katie, thanks so much for watching. Uh, have you all have, and this is for uh, any of you, uh, by the way, uh, have you had uh, heard of any games for the elderly and for those uh, with dementia? Um, is that something that, that, that that we know about, I haven't heard. Of. No, but I believe that one of the speakers coming on later might know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can we can address that later. Mm -hmm. uh, and here is the other question: uh, What responsibility does the gaming community have to address issues like a, the addictive nature of video games and also violence as well? Sorry, the what nature? The, what what responsibility uh, does the gaming community have to address issues like the addictive nature of video games, uh, video game addiction, basically? Mm -hmm. um, any hmm. thoughts on that? Uh, I would like to say that when I examine myself and I look at my consumer behavior, right, I find that I am reliant on subscription services to consume my media, mm -hmm. right? And so I am part of, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of the, that, uh, when a business looks at that, they're looking at like, how do I optimize, right? Like, how do I optimize for people playing? How do I optimize for retention? How do I optimize? For, um, for any of those things. And so you'll see that the designs follow that, right? Like they have to optimize so that they can continue to run, right? And with prices being continued to press down because we want everything for less, um, it becomes more and more difficult for a diversity of voices to be included in the industry. So I'm not here to say that we should get rid of those things. I like gaming, I like gambling sometimes. I like things that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, could be addictive. Um, so there's that as a consumer I have to be aware of. But I think if our industry 
believes in the medium that we love, that we should be investing in the things that will diversify voices. Um, and that's not just about all the typical spheres that we talk about, but it's also age, and it's also um, you know, where we are in our time of lives and the type of stories that we're telling as we grow older. I'm 40, almost 40, and I grew up with video games. The stories I'm interested in are way different mm -hmm. than they were when I was 18. Mm -hmm. um, but the audience hasn't quite, uh, they're still a few years off, you know? And so I think that if we invest in the future, um, in, in being a patron of the arts in that way, that I think we're gonna see a continued growth. I think as a consumer, it kind of reminds me of what Anita just said too, about being a more critical uh, uh, reader, essentially, right? Um, and being critical of what you love and making sure that you don't get addicted to it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't gonna say anything because I don't, I'm not, there's a lot of research and work being done in the field of game. Yeah, and I, right I also now, don't wanna use not, addiction as like, yeah. like yeah. As, as too much word either. Too. Yeah, and it's not yeah. an area of study that I'm, I'm I feel like I can speak to, but I think that it is it is real and that we should provide um, or we should have mechanisms of support as we would with any other kind of um, issue that might arise. And if it's something specifically happening in games, then you know we should definitely be conscious and aware of that and provide those tools. I'm gonna shamelessly plug something right now, actually, because it sort of doesn't smoothly go, but I'm doing it anyways. <laughs> um, because I've been thinking a lot about how do we support each other in the games community. Mm -hmm. um, last year, me Too hit the games industry where several women and non-binary folks came out around um, abusive men in the industry and at Feminist Frequency we were like, well, crap, what are we gonna do? Because we know something about toxicity and we know something about video games and we decided to launch a, a couple of initiatives and so we're about to launch a hotline. Um, it's the Games and Online Harassment Hotline and it is for anyone in the orbit of games, whether you're a player, a competitor, a developer, um, it is a professionally staffed hotline that is there for folks when they need it. So if it is around issues of addiction or you're having a hard time at work with crunch or whatever it might be, we will be there to support you and provide referrals to other, um, other networks and resources that are familiar with games specifically. Um, and that's not live yet, but you can get information for it at gameshotline.org. Wow. I was awesome. just gonna add, we have to remember how to engage um, at people to people again. Mm -hmm. It's not just gaming. Um, most people are on their phones right now. Probably a lot of folks in the audience have their, their phones too. You can be in a room where you're supposed to be talking to people and people are sitting there um, not actually interacting. And so there's a cultural aspect that we have to think about of the value of actually true you know, face-to-face -face communication, talking to each other again, um, understanding how, those, how important those connections are. And, and it's that's I think a, a broader issue than just gaming alone, but I think mm -hmm. it's something that's happening in our culture in a lot of different ways that we should be very conscious of. Yeah, I miss people's faces. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question, and we're just got a kind of lightning round. It's a lighter one. Uh, what games uh, for good have inspired you, basically, or what what games have made you feel good? Oh shit. Hmm. You could start with. Sorry. Congresswoman, you can start <laughs> well, with. Well, I just was, uh, we were talking about Golf Story earlier. Yeah. I mean, um, for me, it's that fun of that, that combination of being able to, like, play Golf Story with my son, to sit with someone and play mm -hmm. and engage. It could be um, online or it could be just sitting in a room with someone. Um, I think there's that opportunity to, to do something fun where you can have a little bit of competition back and forth. Uh, and, and that's, you know, lighthearted and engaging. Um, and so there's many different types of games out there. I don't spend a lot of time, um, I don't get a lot of time to play, um, but- You're I, not that busy, it's uh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I think those are the things for me that um, that kind of fit that, that mix that are fun to do. And that aren't, because uh, a lot of gaming can be, back to the kind of, comment can be uh, hugely time consuming. And so being able to do something, engage and dis disconnect and be done, um, I think that's a nice thing versus feeling like you have to you know, stay on it forever. We, have, we actually have a question for Lawal, and I guess okay. this will be the last one then. Uh, can you discuss more about the specific ways video games can help build peace, reduce ethnic conflict, especially in the international context? Wow. Yeah, big question. Uh, yeah. question. And you have two Can minutes. you save us? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really a big question for me because um, it's also an area of my, uh, my focus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
to me, I feel like true peace is something that is built over time. And it's, um, we are an industry that is defined by people that love what they want to play. And uh, to me, when, when we design games, more games should be more on stories and letting people understand really what are the causes of war? What, are, what does it mean to live in a peaceful environment? So the more you play that, it, it gives you that idea of like having that peace of mind and understanding the stories of what are the, what are the causes of war, what can, what can we be able to do to respond to such kind of war. I, I have a game that is more, that actually help people to really respond, how do they understand peace? How do they understand war? How do they respond when there's war somewhere? So, so it bring people together and discuss about war and conflict and, and put their own input on how they can be able to resolve conflict. So I feel like games are really powerful tool to be able to like really help people think about that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got two yeah. more questions, I guess. So basically, <laughs> well, we'll continue. Oh, go ahead, Ryan. Well, I was just gonna say, I mean, the thing that I've most noticed about joining the games industry mm -hmm. uh, professionally is all the people that I've met that are not like me. Exactly. Um, and so like, uh, that for one has caused me to treat people like humans rather than groups. Right, And I think that the more we do that and the more that our work both gets people next to each other on the couch mm -hmm. playing games together yeah. or in their favorite sport, eSports, playing games together or sharing their stories mm -hmm. through this medium, the more we will humanize each other, I hope. Anita, anything else you'd like to add? Um, I, I think I'm excited. You're, you're asking about um, games that good. were interesting, yeah, and I, my brain always good. just goes blank whenever anyone asks me about games, yeah. <laughs> like specific games. And I, I, I'm hopeful by games like um, Ryan's and, and folks who can do things that are different. Um, that I get so excited when we see games that are pushing boundaries, that are trying new things, um, that are telling different stories in different ways, because the thing about games is that they're so unique. They're unlike any other form of media we have. And I would love to see this industry, and I'm, I'm enjoying watching this industry, experiment with what it means to use that interactivity and storytelling to make impacts. And Games for Good can be everything from like, you know, we're gonna educate you on a very specific, you know, conflict or issue or what have you, but it can also be, um, you know, it, it can be a queer woman of color who gets to go into space. Right, as the main protagonist, and that like girls get to play that growing up, for example. And so I'm I'm excited about the the range that we're slowly starting to see in this space. Okay, well that's about all the time we have for tonight. The four of you, thank you so much for coming all the way out here to DC and to our newsroom uh, to talk about this. It's been such a pleasure to have you all here. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey guys, how's it going? Good. Uh, my name's Jeff Turner. Uh, I work at the Washington Post. I uh, run ad product here. Um, my role is really to co connect our brands with our community here, our core readers and subscribers. Um, and I'm gonna be moderating the panel here today on the power of play, uh, basically how the video game industry is creating its own community. Um, that, and that community is transcending culture, uh, driving innovation, and that will ultimately transform the way that we teach, learn, heal, and play. Uh, so with me, I have Stanley Pierre-Louis, who is the President and Chief uh, Executive Officer of the Entertainment Software Association. Uh, Stan and the ESA recently released a campaign called The Game Generation, um, and that brings to light the positive social impact aspects of video games beyond just having fun. Um, so we'll touch a bit on that during this panel. Um, also, I have uh, Renee Gittens, uh, who is the Executive Director of the International Game Developers Association. Uh, Renee and the IGDA are on a mission to support and empower game developers. Uh, and recently released a developer satisfaction survey, which we'll also get into. 
Uh, and finally, Susanna Pollock, who is the president of Games for Change. Uh, and Games for Change and Susanna are responsible for the video game arcade uh, that is outside. Um, so if you have not visited pre-meeting, uh, please check that out. Uh, it's, it's super, super cool. Uh, so thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, to start, my first question is really to Stan. Um, the video game industry is the fastest growing form of entertainment in the United States. And what I think I'm really wondering is how influential is this community at large, and, and how do you really view that? Well, thanks for, thanks for having us, and, and thank you all for coming. You know, the video game industry is actually enriching our culture and strengthening our economy. And it does it in a number of ways, but first let me just give some statistics so people understand the scale and scope of the industry. 65% of American adults play video games. That's 164 million American adults. And it spans all demographics. You have just as many people who are over 50 playing as you do under 18. And in fact, 46% of gamers are women. The average age is 33. Now what that shows is there's a span of, of audiences that you need to reach and we're seeing more and more games reach those audiences. And yet many times we find that video games are put in a negative light. And I'll give you an example. If I'm binge watching my favorite program over the weekend on my tablet, people will be excited to know what I thought of the show and did I get to the end. But if I spent the weekend trying to get all to the gaming levels of my game, they'll wonder what's going on. Right, right. And right. the flip side should be the case. And that's why we launched Game Generation, because we want to celebrate what video games bring to our culture, our society, to our families, and to our economy, but mainly what it does to bring us together. And we're finding a few things. First of all, people play video games because they're challenging and they're fun. And if you haven't played in a while, go back and play the modern games and you will be very excited about what you see. <laughs> um, but we're finding that there are side benefits that people are talking about. And some of that got discussed on the first panel right. and some you'll talk about later on uh, this evening. Um, community. You've heard that word several times. 65% of people play together either in person or online because of community. And that's what's really fueled the tremendous growth of our industry. Esports, I think, is an offshoot of that. It's another form of communal playing. Uh, you're also seeing inclusivity becoming a primary goal of the industry. Uh, and probably the most heralded of these um, uh, developments has been the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which is a new controller out about a little over a year that allows people of different abilities, different physical abilities to play. And uh, you probably saw the Super Bowl ad last year for the Xbox Adaptive Controller, which was the most moving Super Bowl ad I think played. Um, so that's exciting. Yeah. And then the other thing you're seeing in the video game community is a growth of video games being used in other fields. And so in education, for example, the largest provider of civics education today is a company called iCivics. It's free to middle schoolers, and it was developed um, as a legacy project by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And that's exciting to know that her passion for making sure that the next generation of leaders got civics education comes through a video game. So I think the future is really bright and bold for our society because of what video games do for us. Yeah, and the tremendous scale that comes along with that as well. Yeah. Um, Renee, to you, so we, we were catching it backstage and you were saying that you've done everything from marketing to building to playing around video games. So you're, you're in terms of the size and scope and growth, you've been part of that. Um, how do you feel that video games are helping bring together people within the community, um, you know, from all different backgrounds, aspects, et cetera? Yeah, well, you really see communities based around games everywhere whether they're in stadiums cheering for their favorite esports team, or around late night playing of Mario Kart and Halo, or even in online communities, both within and outside of the games themselves. Um, last night, I was playing World of Warcraft with my guild of 14 years. Before I met games, I had been kind of an awkward, shy kid without any friends. And video games not only inspired confidence in me, but online games allowed me to, sorry, online games allowed me to practice my social skills and to make friends. So now with these friends of 14 years, we've helped each other get jobs. We've supported each other through hard times. And we've even, well, fallen in love. So you can see the development of these communities everywhere. And my story is really not unique. 
games build bonds and friendships, whether they are online or in person. I think we can really see that games bring people together everywhere. Yeah, and to, to that point, so Susanna, we were catching up on some of the actual um, uh, bringing together different abilities, actual physical abilities, and I know you wanted to elaborate a little bit on that and how um, people from different physical abilities and backgrounds can really be feel included as part of this overall right. community. Yeah, so th the wonderful nature about games is that you can step in and experience something, um, one, anonymously, or step into the role of another person, <laughs> or connect with people from diverse locations, diverse backgrounds, um, and reach out and and be a, a, an equal, right? And, and, yeah. and overcome, perhaps, sensitivities, or maybe what you experienced before you discovered games. Um, so games have this opportunity uh, to bring people across countries, geographical locations, uh, socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, um, ages. You know, we have one of the things that we've been uh, seeing and tracking is the is the amount of uh, activity that seniors are playing. I know that was a question from the earlier, earlier panel, but the AARP has done uh, a lot of research about how their community really enjoys games. And they've gotten to the point where they're starting to commissioning and partnering on how to bring game experiences to their communities. So there is this special um, quality about games that, uh, that even the playing field and that anyone can participate in. Fantastic. Um, so I, I wanted to, to touch a little bit of, about the uh, IDGA's latest report card. I, I scanned through it. I um, was hoping you could elaborate uh, for those in the audience who have not. Yeah, so the IGDA runs the Developer Satisfaction Survey to get an understanding of the state of the game development community and how it has changed over time. And this most recent survey has shown a lot of really promising results. We've seen a growth in women within the game industry, now representing 24% of game developers. And we've seen a growth of participation in game development from countries all around the world. We're really seeing uh, the game development industry sort of blooming and coming into not only the best its place it can be with diversity and creativity, but along with stability. And it really is showing the success of games and the growth of the game industry. And so Stan, um, we, we were talking a little bit about um, examples of the video game industry as a, as a booming job sector. Um, I was hoping you could give just kind of your thoughts on how video games are changing other industries, not just the gaming industry itself, but kind of that path down the line. Sure, absolutely. First of all, in terms of the economic sector, uh, we're an engine for economic growth. Uh, right now, the video game industry represents $43 billion in revenue in the U.S. alone. Uh, and you're, you're seeing that job creation is part of that story more than 220,000 jobs created through the video game industry and all high paying jobs. And so it's one of these industries that continues to grow and have international impact because we're a trade surplus industry. Yeah. And part of that is the fact that we are seeing a gamification of lots of other industries. So you're seeing, for example, in the medical field, doctors being trained uh, using VR tools to enhance their abilities. Uh, you're also seeing physical therapy sessions now involving games to enhance and increase uh, the engagement that patients have in their rehabilitation uh, therapy. And you're also seeing it in job, job training. UPS, for example, uses VR training to assist drivers in looking for hazards and understanding what may come down the road, literally. Uh, and you're also seeing Walmart onboarding its uh, new employees uh, for store management, but also for things like Black Friday management when you've, you've got uh, an overwhelming number of people coming to shop. So you're beginning to see the gamification yeah. of everything, and that's fueling even more uh, engagement with games. Yes, yeah. yeah, Suzanne? Um, I'd like to add, too, about the opportunity that learning how to make games is also a fantastic opportunity for young people to learn STEM, STEAM skills, and other 21st century skills. The process of of making a game, of course, includes coding, right? And yep. there's that piece of it. But thinking like a designer and thinking like how to problem solve, how, the critical thinking skills, some of the softer skills that are very transferable to many different uh, in industries are skills that, that we're seeing are, are at being activated and encouraged within the middle and high school level. And of course, it opens up their minds to thinking, oh my god, I can be a 
creator of this content I love so much as opposed to just being a consumer. And that has encouraged a lot of young people to forward in this path. So I mentored high school students in game development and just over an internship of six or 12 months, they showed so much more interest in the topics they were studying in school because they learned how they could apply right. towards something that they were passionate about. I mean, any subject you can think of, even history can have applications within video games and seeing those all come together in one medium is really wonderful and inspires kids. Yeah, and we were talking a lot about like the social good of that, like human empowerment of learning and accomplishing those tasks. Yeah, there's something I mean inherent in in playing games about that sense of um, well purpose, determination. You learn uh, tenacity, resilience, and of course there's the the motivation to to achieve and to master a skill. Right. All yeah. of that is inherent in any commercial game, but think about applying that to a learning environment. Yeah, right? in fact, in the learning environment, they're finding. Uh, that it does enhance uh, student interest. 71% of teachers, in fact, say when they use digital games for learning, kids not only want to learn more, but they enhance their computational skills. So Meaning they retain that. They retain it and they learn the computational aspects of it even more. So it is fueling a lot of interest in STEM, as you said, but also in learning in general. So this is a good, a good segue to my last question for each of you, which is if you're projecting 10 years down the road, what do you think the lasting impact is gonna be on the video game industry of, of, of video games? Like, is it, is it the social good aspect? Is it the technical aspect? What do you think is gonna have that, that lasting impact? Well, I, I certainly think the social good aspect is gonna be enormous. And in fact, uh, in addition to some of the things you heard on the first panel, you're finding that video games are now starting to play a role in larger societal issues. One example is that the UN has started looking at sustainability in lots of areas, and they knocked on the door of the video game industry and said, what are some of the things you're doing? <laughs> and many of our, our, uh, our, our industry leaders uh, had a lot to announce. For example, Xbox announced that they're gonna be putting out 825,000 consoles that are carbon neutral as part of a oh, larger wow. plan that Microsoft has for being carbon uh, negative. You're also finding that games are starting to put in themes about going green and companies working with uh, source materials that are eco-friendly. So you're seeing the environment and social issues, but you're also seeing more health outcomes. And I think also the future of, of 5G rollout and, oh, yeah, and gleaming completely. in the cloud is going to be something that we're looking forward to in the future. Yeah, I mean, within the IGDA, we're seeing a lot of game developers really taking interest in supporting these social issues. We just had a climate special interest group that got started, and of course we have a ton of advocacy groups like Women in Games, Black Games in Games, Latinx, LGBTQ+, and it really shows that these communities come together within games and work to support others in their community and promote their values. I see the marriage between uh, mission-oriented organizations and video games as, yeah. as something that, that uh, we, we're, we are gonna be seeing a lot more of. And at Games for Change, we see that already as, as being a connector of these communities. But working with organizations like the UN or the Red Cross or federal agencies like the National Institute of Health that's putting a lot of research into how these games can affect our lives in a positive way. And it's, it no longer becomes theory, but it actually becomes like evidence-based um, research that says how, how that can be achieved. And I think there's gonna be more and more acceptance in seeing video games in, in all of the sectors of our lives, not just entertainment. That's, that's, I, I completely agree. I mean, especially with brands thinking so much about the social good impact and, and mm -hmm. what they can do for, for everybody. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank for our, uh, everyone for participating in this panel. Uh, like I mentioned, at Games for Change, put on the, uh, the arcade outside. Uh, so after this, please make sure you uh, stop by. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're actually getting to know that person, that person's gaming ability or the way that they talk. Then you develop into a friendship before you actually figure out, oh, what's wrong with this person or what's this person going through?
want to make sure that there's different types of games playing with different types of features, with different uh, accessories, uh, different ways of actually consuming the content, so that everybody gets a feel for like, oh, that's something I can actually be a part of, or there's something I'm interested in. As opposed to us just saying like, here's our world, come and live in it. We want to create a world that everybody feels included and, and comfortable in and can have fun. All right, hello again, everyone. I'm Gene Park again with the Washington Post. So good to see you again. And uh, I am joined here uh, by gamer advocate and chief operations officer of Able Gamers Charity, Stephen Spong. Uh, we're going to talk about how he makes video games more accessible, uh, the the mission of Able Gamers, mm -hmm. and how controller technology has evolved, as well as your own personal journey. Uh, before we get started, I again want to remind you that you can tweet questions for Steve. Uh, using the hashtag post live, hashtag post live, <laughs> and I'll get to a couple later uh, in our discussion. Uh, but Steve, uh, tell us about your story. How did you first get into gaming? Tell us about your gaming journey. Uh, you know, gaming for me was really a way of life. It is something that is very cliche in our industry, but uh, for me, it really was. You know, when I was in high school. Uh, you know, my friends were beginning to go to clubs and they were beginning to go to these social functions that I couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, our local club in Pittsburgh had one stair just outside of it that what could have been a moat to the castle for me it was all the same, you know, I mm -hmm. couldn't participate. So, but I could take my Nintendo to my buddy's garage and we could go play, you know, games and NES games and hang out uh, with all of our people. And really that just ramped up from there when it was a matter of going to online worlds like Ultima Online, where you could meet people for the first time and really form friendships and bonds. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the online community that, that really helped you kind of reach out with folks, right? Yeah, you know, the great thing about online video gaming is just the, the social exposure you get. If you have a mind that's willing and a body that's unable, you know, video games can really open an, a window to an otherwise inaccessible world. Yeah. We have these situations where people can't get out into just not a society as a, at large. What we don't talk about a lot in video gaming and really just the general media is loneliness and how it's an epidemic, how everyone experiences loneliness from now and again. And gaming can stop that. You know, you can form these bonds with people that are amazing. Uh, you know, we were just joking about it in the green room when, you know, it's not about distance, it's about closeness. You and I can be a country apart, but we can still be extremely close and form a friendship that'll last for decades by playing together in virtual worlds. Well, I mean, that's amazing because like so much of us back there in the green room, we've all known of each other. Yeah. You know, I've been following you for a long time. You've been following my friend John back there. John, what's up? And then like, so, but we've never really, really hung out, but we, it feels like we're, 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 we know each other pretty well, right? Yeah. yeah, you just click right into it. You know, uh, when you think about when we were young, you know, it was, don't talk to strangers on the internet. And now yeah. it's, you know, some of your best friends can be from the internet. And I don't see a difference between internet friendships and real friendships because to me, they're real. Yeah, and it doesn't freak you out when you meet someone from online, right? Yeah, the only thing that freaks me out is whenever it's like, who, oh, you're, you're so-and-so at Twitter. Okay, got you, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how, did you become the, how did you come to join the leadership at, at Able Gamers? Tell me about how you got involved with them. Well, where did that start? Yeah, well, that was uh, an amazing story where, so an amazing gentleman named Mark Barley started Able Gamers, founded 15 years ago, and right after the inception of Able Gamers, uh, he had had a blog on, was just a website with a blog, and it was an article up there about how you can't play World of Warcraft with only one hand. And I was 25 and I knew everything and I was like, ha ha, Mark Marley, I got you now. And I sent off a message, ha, you suck. I know that you can do this. And fortunately for me, he didn't turn me away as the arrogant little 20 year old that I was. He said, all right, Steve, you think you can do better writing? So I wrote it and I wrote how you can play with just one hand, uh, whether you're putting two hands together on a mouse like I do or whether you only have one hand that you can game with. Uh, on the mouse and you can play. And it got some traction. Somebody actually reached out to me and said, thank you, I didn't know you could do that. Now I can play World of Warcraft. So then I went, oh, okay, this is cool. So then I wrote another one and another one and people kept coming to me saying, hey, you know, I didn't know this was possible and you changed my life. And I suddenly realized, wait a minute. So I came to Able Gamers because I wanted to find a way that I could game 
But then I found out what felt even better was making other people be able to game. That's a great transition into what the work that you and Able Gamers have done with Microsoft and Microsoft Xbox. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's a device called the Adaptive Controller. Amazing device, I've never used it, but uh, it's gotten so much praise, it's gotten awards uh, uh, for, for what it's done. Uh, can you, uh, it's, it's helped widen the spectrum of who can play. Uh, can you talk, talk to us about the collaboration? Uh, how were you involved? What did they ask you? What were, the, what were some of the things that their designers had to keep in mind? Yeah, you know, it was amazing working with Microsoft and Xbox on this controller. So Able Gamers had come up with a controller called an Adroit Switchblade, and it essentially did exactly what the XAC did, but it was about $400, which is a hefty price tag. Not exactly and accessible. No, not accessible to most of us, let alone if you have a disability. Yeah. Right. So what Xbox was able to do was to take that idea, take that concept of being able to put switches all around your body. Just think about the Staples Easy Button, right? You can't hold a controller, but I can put a bunch of buttons around you and you can play them like a keyboard, then you can play on an Xbox, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can do that for 100 bucks or a little bit more, then that's grandma money. That is uh, friend money. They can give you uh, an Xbox controller for Christmas. Uh -huh. So uh, what was amazing with, about that was working with them in secrecy for three and a half years. I can't believe we all kept it a secret. And it's mostly because there were golden robots in my closet that were gonna jump out and beat me if I talked about it. Um, so, 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 uh, Jeff Bezos, get on that. No. Yeah, so. <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding. <laughs> So, uh, it, but it was amazing because we got to consult very early with it and help them from the ground up. And my favorite story to tell, which I'll probably be visited by a golden robot later tonight, um, is, is uh, they couldn't show us the original prototype because the lawyers didn't want us to see it even though we were ground level consultants. So they drew it on a piece of paper and they're like, here's what it's gonna look like. And then we got to tell them sort of, you know, where our pain points were and you know, what they could do better than you know, we could working. And again, we built these with a company called Evil Controllers one at a time, literally. And that was as cheap as we could make them was $395. So, you know, being able to make them was uh, a dream come true because we got to help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. What were some of the pain points? And there was a discussion uh, backstage where you were talking about easy mode, right? And you don't, you, like, um, you know, easy mode in video games is obviously it helps players uh, right. go, get through. Yeah. But you were talking about the difference between yeah. having an easy mode and having a game that's accessible to you. Right. Well, you know, there's an amazing research team at Able Gamers who does all of these uh, high end studies on what it's like to be a gamer. And, you know, what we're finding is that the levels of challenge for everybody are different depending on what you have available to you. So if you have ability to move all of your hands together and I have the ability to only use the mouse, then for you and I to then play the game at the same level, we need different accessibility options, right? So, uh, you know, what's, what's really been great about that argument, although it was feisty and there's lots of people on the internet who yelled at me about it, uh, it really came down to we don't need easy modes in video games, we need equality modes. We need a mode where if you're very super great at Dark Souls and you can play it without any options, fantastic, but maybe I wanna have a good time with it too. Yeah. And maybe a couple accessibility options would be just enough to put us on the same level and with that level playing field, we can enjoy the game at the same level. Mm -hmm. um, companies like Microsoft, Naughty Dog, among others, have had a bigger push for accessibility in games mm -hmm. uh, in the last few years. Uh, some companies like Nintendo have, have had a harder time mm -hmm. uh, implementing this. Uh, what is holding some, some of the bigger companies back? Um, is, it a, is, it a, is it a mentality issue? Is it financial? What's your take on that? Yeah, Nintendo's a very small, poor company. I don't think they can afford <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, to work on accessibility. It's really sad. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, uh, you know, what's amazing of, about uh, Nintendo was they were actually the first. They built a controller that someone could use if all they could use was their head. Mm -hmm. And it looked sort of like a harness around your neck. Mm -hmm. And then they got away from it, and they never came back. And we don't know why they don't reach out to Able Gamers. They don't reach out to advocates like me. Um, but we hope that with time, they'll see that Microsoft, Xbox, and PlayStation, and even now coming up, Google are working on accessibility and that they should join the party and let people with disabilities enjoy the virtual worlds we all love. Mm -hmm. Which is incredible because Nintendo is 
known so much for the, the whole yeah. accessibility thing. Right. It's just not for disabled gamers. No, and, and it's, it's sad because we just actually launched uh, a, con a controller adapter called the Freedom Wing. Mm -hmm. And the Freedom Wing is a really cool adaption where I can plug my wheelchair that you see me sitting on the stage with today into an Xbox, and I can play on an Xbox with this wheelchair. And that was not something that was even possible a week ago. Well, I mean, I had the adapter for a little while, so I could, but nobody else could. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's great. Technology's coming along, and I hope that all the juggernauts in the industry will get on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed the industry becoming more open to the subject? I guess, I guess you have, right? Uh, especially oh. with, with Microsoft kind of going all in on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, they had a Super Bowl commercial about the, the controller last year, didn't they? They did. They had the Super Bowl commercial, which was great. But it's important that we not get caught up in running around the room and talking about how great one controller is when there's 46 million gamers with disabilities who need help, and they all need different adaptations. And when we're talking about these setups, they can be a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand. So it's not cheap. It's not easy, and it takes a specialized set of skill to figure out how to put it all together. And so, what are some of the bigger stigmas that that, that disabled gamers have to face? And what are, uh, in terms of, you know, you you said earlier that a lot of people got mad at you, um, and you're 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 quite prominent on Twitter. Uh, thank so, you. Yes. Yeah. Now follow me at Steven Spawn. Um, yeah, so, him. Uh, <laughs> shameless plug. Um, so, uh, no, you know, the great thing about uh, being vocal and out there on the internet is that I have this platform. I am blessed to have people who want to follow me, listen to what I'm talking about. But that stigma that we're talking about hasn't gone away. It's not going to go away anytime soon, uh, but we're, we're fighting it, you know. When I started streaming on Twitch, the only reason I did was because a friend of mine named Craig kept telling me how great Twitch was and that Twitch is, you know, where it's at, man. You need to go stream. You need to go play games. And he sort of challenged me. He literally said, Steve, you're on social media but you don't talk about your personal gaming setup. You don't talk about your own life and the personal side of it. And I said, well, I'm afraid. I'm afraid people are gonna make fun of me. And it, you have to open yourself up on those platforms. So even though Twitter is open, it's also where I can just not answer somebody's tweet if they make fun of my, you know, my weight or my wheelchair or whatnot. On Twitch, it's live, it's happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm lucky to say that uh, in the end, Craig was right in that it was a very welcoming place. And I have been able to forge friendships with people that on, on a massive scale, I have more friends now than I did before streaming. Uh, and you know, I don't know that I'm necessarily the most entertaining, you know, next Dr. Lupo kind of guy, but I'm just trying to farm a small community where people can get along and feel safe. And mm -hmm. you know, to me, that's, that's sort of what's important. I have people come up to you and say, it means a lot to see your setup to see how you came. Yeah, they have, and that's, that's honestly what's continuing to push me to keep streaming. You know, uh, I put in you know, my 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week with Able Gamers, and then I have my own advocacy that I'm trying to do, and now I'm trying to be a streamer too. And there's only so many hours in a day, no matter how many letters I write to the Congress to make more. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, what I'm really you know, out there doing is trying to be a representative. I am in a privileged position where I can tell the stories that I wish I had seen when I was that young. I have people who are 16 years old who are coming up to me and saying, you know, I didn't want to do this because people were going to make fun of me. And you talked about how you were worried about that, but you did it anyway. And now people are coming to you and respecting you. And I think I can do that too. And it sounds cheesy like a stage answer, but you can see on my streams, I talk about the same thing. I just want to have that representation out there. And I reached a point in my life where I said, I can't keep asking for representation to be on the screen outside of Professor X. I swear to goodness, one point person mentions <laughs> Wolverine to me. Um, but uh, you know, I had to be one of those people. I had to, to show myself and be willing. So um, it's been fun, and I'm glad that we decided to do it. Yeah, and I'm glad you're out there, and I'm very happy that you're here to tell, to tell our yeah. story, or tell your story. So yeah. thank you so much, Stephen, for, for being here. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for all, all for listening. Appreciate it. <laughs> thanks so much, man.
It's not just a couple of people or a couple of organizations, it's the world recognizing that video games is an impressive feat and challenge for many people out there. Anyone can be an esports champion. You don't necessarily have to do um, a lot of things that like your mainstream sports are, and I think that that's what the allure is. So give it another like couple of years, it's going to like definitely take over, I would say. Well, hello everybody. I'm Mike Hume. I'm the editor of Launcher, the Washington Post's home for uh, dedicated coverage of video gaming and esports. Uh, we are here to, dis uh, to discuss the rise of esports. Uh, before we begin, I just want to see a quick show of hands. How many people here are familiar with esports and what it entails? All right, so pretty good. We'll try and uh, educate the rest of you here with our esteemed panel. Uh, next to me, I would like to introduce Chris Greeley. He's the commissioner of the League Championship Series, uh, the North American Pro Esports Circuit of League of Legends from Riot Games. Next, we have Grant Pranjape, the VP of Business with the Washington Justice DC's Overwatch League team. And finally, we have Zach Leonsis, the senior VP and general manager of Mon Monumental Sports and Entertainment. You probably know him from the Washington Capitals, Washington Wizards, Washington Mystics, several other ventures there. Uh, he is also the breaker of chains and on the board of directors for Team I Liquid. That title. <laughs> I'm going to tell my dad about that. That's a good one. Before we begin, uh, remember you can submit questions to the panel using the hashtag #PostLive on Twitter. But uh, let's get started, shall we? So, following this past season, Chris, uh, I got an email from Riot Games that claimed that the LCS was the third most popular major professional sports league in the US among 18 to 34 year olds. That's right. Okay, so that's according to data from Nielsen and presumably includes leagues like National Hockey League, Major League Baseball. It does. Okay, my dad's head just exploded. <laughs> <laughs> How uh, can you explain this? I mean, obviously we, we know about the growth of eSports, but this is quite a claim. Yeah, we're a, um, we're a digital first sport for a digital first audience. That's the, that's the catchphrase. Uh, we have the, <clears throat> pardon me, the audience has grown organically since 2011 when League of Legends hosted its first world championship uh, and has continued to grow every year since. We saw such dramatic growth between 2011 and 2012 that in 2013 we started a uh, domestic league in North America and in Europe that created a league structure that you would see in conventional sports. Uh, and since then, we have continued to grow every year. Uh, viewership is uh, up year over year uh, with you know the, the normal variance that you expect to see. But when we go out to St. Louis or to Detroit or to Frisco, Texas, where our spring finals are this year, you know our fans show up early. They're loud. They're passionate, and you wouldn't know. <clears throat> if you didn't realize you were at an esports event, you wouldn't know it by looking at the fans. Right. And Zach, you obviously walk in both of these worlds. How do you compare the interest and the rising interest in esports to the interest levels of traditional sports? Well, you know, 2019 was a really interesting year. Gaming as a category surpassed music, at home entertainment, and box office in terms of just size and scope. So clearly, it was something that, that was growing for quite some time. We first invested into esports uh, nearly five years ago when we found Team Liquid, and we realized the writing was on the wall. We are very invested in our cable world, our, our, our traditional media world with the Capitals and the Wizards, and we see the trends with cord cutting and cord shaving, and we thought this is really the first ever live event category that's digital first and linear second. And there, you know, like you just mentioned, there are a lot of eyeballs on it mm -hmm. too. The monthly active users are dramatic. The monthly active viewers are even bigger for games like League of Legends. And so we really needed to be students and understand what was happening here. And as we went through our journey, we've learned a lot. We've learned that authenticity really matters. And I think that one of the most spectacular things about esports is that it's truly organic, it's communal. Um, I sometimes compare platforms like, you know, Epic Games is Fortnite more like a social platform. Kids coming home from school and putting on their headsets and that's how they're socializing these days. So um, we've learned a lot and we continue to learn more. We've seen a tremendous amount of growth with Team Liquid. We do think there are learnings that the esports world can take from traditional sports. 
um, potential, you know, in the future as localization happens, and Grant can tell you a lot about that with the mm -hmm. Overwatch League. Um, we're doing a lot with the NBA 2K League with our Team Wizard District Gaming, and we're also launching an eSports uh, endeavor on the CAP side called CAPS Gaming too. So um, we believe, and um, you know, we, we, we're happy to be a part of it. Uh, Grant, as Zach alluded to, Overwatch League is taking a very ambitious step this season. Yep. Uh, localized weekly events in regional markets. Obviously, that includes the Washington <laughs> Justice. So how's your sleep been trying to organize that? Uh, yeah, uh, th there has not been much sleep in the Justice <laughs> office uh, really since the offseason started. Yeah, so I think we, we term Overwatch as the, the first city-based global franchised esports league. So uh, you have the city-based teams. You have Washington Justice, Philadelphia Fusion, NYXL uh, with New York. And I think uh, the Overwatch League had an incredible first two seasons out in LA. You know, we. Uh, treated our players like all-star athletes, very similar to the, the Wizards and, and Caps. And uh, there was always a little bit of a, a, you know, a funny feeling, I think, in that you had a team that had a city tie-in and they were never home. And so for the 2020 season, we're really excited to bring, uh, bring all of the teams home. And uh, you know, for us, that means hosting five home stands here in DC, uh, the first three of which will be at the Anthem down at the Wharf uh, and the following two at uh, Events DC's uh, new arena, actually the Wizards uh, practice court and the home court for the Mystics and Go-Go as well uh, over at ESA. So uh, I think we're, we're really excited about it. I think it, it unlocks a lot, of, a lot of doors that were previously closed to eSports. You know, you have uh, a really passionate local fan base that, that can attend and, and see their home team in person. And then you have local sponsors, you know, the, the Lidos Giants, you know, Geico's of the world who are, who are right here in the DMV able to activate not only digitally, but also in person uh, with, with assets that they're familiar with. And how has that local partnership aspect been going for in your experience? Yeah, I mean, Events DC has been a huge supporter of, uh, of the team uh, since before the team was actually founded, which was, was remarkable. Um, and obviously, you know, being able to take two events to, to one of their venues was, was really important to us. Um, I think, you know, we've had a lot of good conversations with partners and a few announcements to come in the not so distant future. So, um, but yeah, I, I think for, for brands, you know, wanting to active in esports, there's, there's obviously a huge educational piece to it, and, and Zach and, and the MSC partnership team can, can certainly speak to that. Um, but once you have time to kind of explain, you know, this is a highly captive 18 to 34 year old audience, um, and you also get assets that are local and that you're familiar with, uh, we've, we've had partners who are, who are really excited about, about coming on board. Uh, Zach, in our reporting with Launcher, it seems that sponsorships are certainly one of the biggest revenue drivers for esports leagues and for teams. How does that compare to traditional sports in terms of demand? Are there companies out there that are craving esports more than traditional sports these days, or what's that dynamic like? Well, I think uh, you know a criticism of esports is that there, there's been a lot of hype and have the revenues match that, and I think that very quickly the revenues are. Uh, Team Liquid has grown revenues dramatically from when we first invested. And it's not just prize money, it is sponsorships, it's uh, dollars from streaming. They have a landmark agreement um, that's in the tens of millions of dollars uh, with Twitch. Um, and, you know, we see interest on the, uh, you know, in the sort of the professional sports crossover eSport leagues, too. People are very interested. We just announced earlier today a partnership um, actually with the UAE. There is international appeal in terms of using eSports as a platform for inclusivity um, and, you know, fostering global connections, too. So I think it really just depends on the brand and, uh, you know, what their objectives are. A lot of engineering firms really finding eSports to be a hotbed for recruitment and the like because as Grant mentioned it is a really wonderful um, younger very attractive audience these are engineering savvy highly quantitative very smart um, people when, when I I hired Grant three years ago <laughs> and one of the things that sold me on Grant was Grant said well I built my own computer and I said, well, I, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. So <laughs> you really are, are true endemic, and, and that's something that I find very admirable. Yeah, I, I think it's remarkable. You know, you, you think of, uh, hopefully there's not too many millions of me out there. Exactly, but there, there's probably a few. Um, I, I like to use myself as like kind of the, the worst example uh, of for, for, you know, for a sports owner. I'm 26. Uh, I, I've never owned a cable package. I went, you know, I was a neuroscience major and got my MBA after. But... Um, I, I'm not a fan of hockey or, or basketball or the NFL, really, you know, uh, other than the halftime show for the, the Super Bowl. So for me, like, <laughs> the, my Super Bowl was, was always the LCS finals, right, and, and watching, uh, you know, Faker, you know, 
destroy everyone for SKT. So for me, and, and I think you know, there are there are a significant portion of, of the audience, you know, the population that are, that are like me. Esports is kind of our our sports of the future. That's right. He's our case study. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Uh, now, Chris, obviously, the Riot Games announced a very significant partnership uh, late in 2019 ahead of the World Championships in Paris. Louis Vuitton partnered with Riot Games. What does that say about where esports is in our cultural awareness scale? I, I think it speaks volumes. Uh, the partnership with LV covered a lot of different things. So uh, they created a trophy case. Uh, for our Summoner's Cup, which is the uh, trophy we give away at our World Championship, or that's, I guess, won at our World Championship. We're not really giving it away. <laughs> uh, it opened up, so it has digital panels on it. It opened up during our opening ceremony. Uh, they worked with us to create uh, digital assets in the game, so we have characters who are wearing Louis Vuitton skins inside of the game. Um, and it's been, it's, it was, it's a far-reaching partnership. I think it, it shows that uh, fashion is taking notice, especially high fashion. Uh, usually what you see in esports is, is streetwear and street fashion and sneaker heads and, and we hit that demographic really hard. But for LV to step in, especially in a year when our world championships were in Paris, uh, I think really shows how far, far along that esports has come. Right. And uh, just to transition a little bit to the, another big topic, broadcast rights. Uh, recently, the Activision Blizzard uh, group cut a deal with YouTube, uh, undisclosed terms, which we're working on. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, working uh, on that those <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, we're getting to the bottom of this yet. But uh, <laughs> it is definitely a very lucrative source of revenue for traditional sports leagues. To date, we haven't really seen that for esports proportionally. What can sports, esports leagues and teams do to really raise that revenue up closer to on par with professional traditional sports leagues? I mean, I, I think the, the biggest driver for it is that um, there are still uh, platforms, especially linear platforms, uh, that look at advertising rates as just being much higher on linear. Um, I don't think that the audience that we're hitting on digital, I mean, Grant called them a, a highly captive audience, which is, a, you know, I think the only piece I'd add to that is they're also highly engaged. Right. Uh, so I, I don't think that advertisers and platforms are properly valuing uh, how important those eyeballs are and uh, how our fans internalize the advertising messages that are being provided to them. When we announced our MasterCard sponsorship, we had fans who were on Reddit and Twitter talking about how they were going out to get a MasterCard because they want to support the sponsors that are supporting the thing that they love. So I, I think that that's going to be a, a big piece, and I think that one day there's going to be that, that watershed and the dam's going to break and we're going to see advertising rates um, start to rise. And I, I think deals are going to help raise it as well. So uh, Riot announced a deal with uh, ML BAM back in, well, I guess it was BAM Tech at that right. point, uh, back in 2016. And although that uh, deal eventually morphed into something that wasn't exactly what it, it began as, um, between that and the deals that have been announced by Activision Blizzard, uh, I think that there is a good base on which to continue to build out broadcast rights. And Grant, obviously, with the news of the move <clears throat> from Twitch to YouTube, a bit of a, a seismic shift in that Twitch was sort of regarded as the flagship platform for esports live broadcasts. From a team perspective, are you guys happy with this move? Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're really excited about it. You know, YouTube has, uh, you know, obviously they just kicked off things with the Call of Duty League, uh, you know, a, a few weeks ago, and um, th they've been a tremendous partner. You look at, you know, Google, and and I think YouTube disclosed, uh, you know, its ad revenue for the first time, and it was fifteen point three billion, I believe. Um, so when you look at, you know, how do you um, you know, take live esports beyond just uh, the audience that's already consuming it. And I mean, Twitch is obviously an incredible platform as well. But you look at, um, you know, the other types of content, and you have on YouTube audiences consuming how-to videos on how to play Overwatch, how-to videos on how to cook a steak, right? You have so many <laughs> ways to, to kind of reach a, a whole new audience that wasn't already just consuming esports content. And I think for us, that's a really big piece of, you know, the localization angle as well, right? We want folks here in the DMV to realize, you know, the Justice are your hometown team, right? I, again, I'm not the sports guy, but I, I know people have very passionate feelings about the hometown team where they were born. Uh, and I think, you know, when you have localization, you have a media partner that can reach beyond just the captive esports audience. That's when you can kind of truly get to the scale that Chris was talking about, where you do have ad, uh, you know, 
media companies, you know, properly valuing uh, you know, the eyeballs that they're getting. And we're seeing big deals in other markets too. Our Chinese league, which uh, the LPL, which has a, a home and away system inside of China, uh, announced large deals selling uh, their broadcast and our world's broadcast inside of China exclusively as well. So mm. I think we're going to continue to see those tides continue to rise. Well, we have a very good Twitter question about the uh, growth of esports at some lower levels. Uh, Colton wants to know, what are your thoughts on the role of esports in high schools, both as a tool for furthering STEM education and for teaching social skills? I, I think it's a, a huge opportunity. Um, varsity sports are not for everyone. We can be honest about that. And creating an environment where you have a team with a shared goal, I mean, there are tons of studies out there that show the benefits of that. And so for you know, that audience, I think it's an absolutely critical part of development, and I highly encourage high schools to start to adopt that. We hosted a couple dozen DC principals um, just a couple of months ago to, to try to encourage that because you know there, there is still a little bit of a stigma. They think that video gaming is bad, that it, it's a waste of time, that you're not studying and doing your homework. It doesn't mean that video gaming is bad. Video gaming can be an incredibly inclusive platform, and um, I think we just need to illuminate that and, and raise awareness of, of, of the good that esports can really bring. And at its heart, it's competition, right? So it's not, Esports aren't only for the kids who can't play varsity sports. I played varsity baseball and lacrosse. I still went home every night and played video games with my friends. So um, I, I think you'll start to see that a lot more too, that it's an additional outlet. It doesn't necessarily have to be a substitute outlet. Um, we have a partner called PlayVS uh, that runs high school League of Legends uh, tournaments in several different states. They have a state champion. It's formatted the, the same way you would see varsity baseball, um, where you play through and playoffs and, and have a champion. And uh, I know that there are programs like that for other games as well. And I think as that continues to expand, it's going to be a kind of great anchor for parents to be able to look at and see the benefits that video games are bringing outside of just the, my kid never goes outside to play because they want to sit and play video games with their friends online all the time. I have one question I'm hoping to get uh, the perspective of each of you on, and that is uh, over the last 10 years, we've obviously seen exponential growth in esports. There are some that would point to that as a bubble, that this is the function of a lot of surplus investment capital flowing into esports franchises. What's the most important thing for esports collectively as an industry to do to succeed and take it to the next level to say, hey, this clearly isn't a bubble, this is legit, it's a thing? Who wants to uh, well, I, I don't think it's a bubble. Um, I see the revenue certainly at Team Liquid and the valuation that that team is driving from, you know, getting third-party dollars. It's pretty amazing. The revenues have tracked behind it, which is fabulous to see. We have worked to um, foster Team Liquid's endemic brand and foster the community that they have. We want to trust them and amplify what they're doing and then nudge when they ask for it and nudge towards professionalization. One of the, the great things that I think we did was we encouraged them to move out of their gamer house and into a real practice facility. We have a, a spectacular uh, facility in Los Angeles, the Alienware Training Facility. We're gonna open a new one in the not too distant future in Europe. And um, you know, at that facility, we've got in-house chef, we've got sports psychologists. We, I, we're, we're treating our players just like we would Alex Ovechkin or John Wall. Um, so it's very, very important. And I, I think uh, you, you start to uh, raise the expectation level with players in terms of you know, really treating their platform with respect. There's a, there, there's a big followership. People look up to these players, um, and they need to rise to the task to you know, remember that that's really the case. And when they're talking on social and talking online, it really matters. Yeah, I think uh, for, for me, it's always about um, you know, collectively working together to build the esports industry. I mean, I'm on a panel with the commissioner of LCS, right? I think uh, <laughs> I'm on a panel with Zach from TL and, and NBA 2K League, right? I think uh, esports, you know, we, we tend to forget like why we, we got into it, right? Like we got into this because we all collectively love video games and we wanted to make you know, our passion into more than, than just a hobby. And um, too often it's this league's doing this, this league's doing that. Like why isn't this better? Why isn't this this way? And, and I think like as leagues and, and teams start collectively working together and, and saying like, no, like we all work in the esports industry. Like how do we 
make this professionalized and something that everyone wants to be a part of. Um, that's how we kind of ensure that it's not just not just a bubble or, or something that, that people want to have a flash in the pan for. I think you can, when you look at outside perceptions looking in, it started in 2012 and 2013 with people saying, why would you want to watch somebody else play video games? Uh, and then you know, we sold out the Staples Center and the Galen Center and Madison Square Garden and people were like, oh, all right, well, sure, but it's not a sport. Uh, and then we continue to bring in sponsors like State Farm and MasterCard and uh, Bud Light and Honda and they're like, well, Okay, sure, but now you know you're you're only on a digital platform and you're you're not mainstream enough. I, I think that esports is in a growth phase, and even though you know we joke all the time that three months in esports is like three years in the in the real world, um, it is still it's very much it's a nascent industry, and there's going to be a lot of growth over time. The people who started in in esports, some of them are going to continue on, and some of them are going to move out as more seasoned professionals come in. I'm sure. In two or three years, my owners are going to walk around and say, "Like, hey, it's been great, Chris, but you know, now we need someone who can." Th thanks for getting us to a hundred million dollars in revenue. We need the man or woman who's going to get us to five hundred million dollars in revenue. Please never say that. I would never um, say that. <laughs> but there, th it's all growth, and it's all you know. We try a lot of things. We try to fail fast and iterate the way startups do in, in Silicon Valley. And I think that you're going to see over time that attitudes are going to shift the longer that esports can can stay around, can become sustainable, can stay in the mainstream. Um, I think games will come and go, but ultimately as long as the kind of core tenant of competitive gaming continues on and continues to grow, you're gonna see people kind of shedding off some of those opinions, especially the idea that we're sitting in a bubble. And uh, this will probably be our final question, but I did want to ask it because this is something that's come up quite a bit since we started at Launcher, and a number of people have asked us to pursue uh, as we've expanded our coverage, and that's diversity. We see a medium in esports where physical attributes shouldn't matter, and yet we do not see a lot of female esports athletes. What can leagues and teams do to foster diversity, particularly from females, in their leagues, on their teams? How do we increase those numbers of esports competitors? I, I think uh, I'll speak <clears throat> for the LCS. Um, we we look at the environment um, around the game uh, and making it more inviting. So, like League of Legends is not a game that you have to be male to be good at. Right. Um, there are lots of women who are in. Uh, are, we call them high elo. They sit at the top of our competitive ladder and they can compete with the pros who are on stage. Um, but in our discussions with them, in the, in the surveys we've taken, in the conversations we've had, I, I think the thing that comes up over and over um, in those interviews is that they want to feel like they can sit on that stage and be accepted by the other pro players that are on stage and by the fans. We've seen, um, especially in, in some other games, as females have tried to go pro, um, terrible backlash against them. So for us, uh, a lot of that education starts with our existing pro players uh, and working with them to make sure that we can create an environment where that abuse doesn't happen at the pro level. Uh, and, and when they see it from fans, our existing pros, the, the men can stand up and say, like, this isn't, this isn't okay, this isn't who we are. Um, and that's a process. And you have to, once, the, once you start to get those, that education in place and, and you're confident that your pro players are in, in the right area, you need someone who's willing to take the risk and step out first and, you know, I hate to keep beating the dead horse that it's a process, but I, I think it's ongoing. Yeah, I, I think for, uh, from a team perspective, right, it's about giving, uh, it's about giving females and, and everyone equal opportunity, right? So at the Justice, we had uh, last year the first female uh, assistant coach in Avala. Um, this year, we, we actually continued and, and had a, uh, you know, our, our, full, our full GM is, is, is Anna Lynn, is, is also a female. So it, for us, it's not about, you know, specifically looking to hire, you know, females or, or whatnot. It's about, you know, if you're the best person for the job and, and there's, there's absolutely no reason you couldn't have a, a female general manager or a female coach in, in Overwatch or, or any sport. Um, so I, I think for, kind of like Chris mentioned, it, it's about having teams and people in, in the positions, you know, making those decisions who are willing to, to have an open mind and, and you know, truly just have, uh, you know, the ability to give everyone the equal opportunity to, to be in, in esports. 
I think it has been a problem, but I think that esports in general is directionally certainly heading in the right direction. I think there have been a lot of advancement in the past five years. I think the NBA 2K League has actually done a very commendable job. The NBA 2K League is actually the only truly co-ed NBA platform league. We, we had a, a female player in the league last year, and the league rolled out a female gamer development platform um, where they were inviting streamers in to try to help them become a pro. What does it take to become a pro? And I, I think all of our expectations that we will have more women in our league this upcoming season. We're developing our own female gamer platform at Monumental. I know Team Liquid is as well. Team Liquid has also been a tremendous leader when it comes to the uh, supporting the LGBTQ community too. So um, just like you were starting off, your score is your score. It's a great equalizer, and um, I think it gets back to elevating the conversation, informing our players and the influencers who matter that they need to be the change, that it needs to be an active change. It can't be a passive experience. Well, that's all the time we have for our panel, but the event will continue. Uh, please stick around. I would love to meet with all of you, as with the team of Launcher. Uh, we also have some uh, games that you can play out in the reception area. So, uh, you know, dust off the joysticks and loosen up the thumbs. Uh, we got some good stuff out there for you. Uh, remember, you can find a replay of tonight's event on thewashingtonpostlive.com. And in the meantime, I hope everyone has a very pleasant evening. Thanks for joining us.